Okay, good. We are recording. So we will have this available for you later as well. And like I just mentioned, practice there with the Q&A section where it is you are calling in from. So we have a good number of people online. I see we have um, David from UK, Joe from Pittsburgh, Brandon, Brand, I don't know if it's Brandon, Mississippi or Brandon from Mississippi. We have Peter from St. Louis, Missouri. We have James from Valrico, Florida. Leaf, where is it that you're calling in from today? I'm, I'm in Paris. We got stuck in Paris before flight stopped. So not a bad place to be. <laughs> no, it's not. And Mike, where are you calling in from today? Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Very nice. And I am here in Belize. So nice to see everybody able to come together. We have I see more and more coming in. We have Brian from Archbald, Pennsylvania, Malcolm from England, Mitch from Illinois, Vance from Southern California, Jody from Key Largo, uh, William or Bill from Las Vegas, Cornelius and Joanne from Brandon, oh, Brandon, Mississippi. Thank you for the clarification. We have Rod from Montreal. And, wow, we have really good representation here. And I see more and more folks coming in. So feel free to type in where it is you are calling in from. But again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is a really interesting topic and we've received so many inquiries through Live and Invest Overseas about people who are looking to diversify their portfolio through timber ownership. So I thought what better than to get Leif Simon on the phone to talk a little bit more about the opportunity and his experience with it so far. So um, I know someone that's a little bit more qualified to introduce Leif. I've known Leif and Kathleen for about eight years at this point, but Mike Cobb, he's one of the co-founders of Hardwoods Unlimited. And Mike, you've known Leif and Kathy, what, 20, 25 years now? Yeah. Why don't you take the stage and, and do a nice introduction for Leif? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Rachel, thanks for pulling this together. And, and I want to thank Leif for being with us today. Yeah, I've known uh, Kathy Pedicord for, I guess, about 25, 26 years and Leif for about 20 now. And yeah, uh, yeah 20 years. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of things over the years together. I, I always like to give a, you know, a full disclosure that uh, we... Uh, w one of my companies, ECI Development, is a uh, uh, is an has an ownership interest in Leaf and Kathy's Losis Lotes project in Panama. In in, in full disclosure, um, but we've we've worked together for many years. We've spoken at each other's conferences. We see each other, um, and 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 you know, Leaf, I I want to thank you for uh, getting the good word out to folks about you know opportunities like the Teak in Panama. Uh, the kinds of investment opportunities that really aren't there in the mainstream that, that most folks never really hear about. And, and you and Kathy do a phenomenal job of, of getting the word out. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I think we've seen uh, recently, and, and I hope maybe you can address this a little bit as well, uh, is the, uh, you know, the travel bans and, and, and people wanting to make an investment in Teak, uh, but unable to get down and quote unquote, kick the dirt or hug the trees or, or do whatever. Um, you know, you, you've been there, you've seen it, you've been to all of our projects over the years. Uh, you know that we've delivered on what we said we would deliver on and, and, uh, and, and you, in fact, you, you actually own Teak as well. So you understand the business and, and, right. and how it works. Um, so uh, so uh, with that, I, I'm really, uh, really glad to have you here today. I appreciate uh, uh, your expertise and again, what you're doing to bring this type of an investment opportunity to folks that, that might not otherwise see it. So uh, Leif, welcome. Well, thank, thanks, Mike. Well, to talk just directly to your question or concern about traveling and visiting an, an investment, um, one thing I talk about, you know this, we, we have a real estate conference coming up in a few weeks that I'll, I'll say it as well, but write about it all the time, is you've got to balance out the cost of due diligence versus the investment. So um, Rachel's going to tell everybody, I think most people have already seen maybe the, the pricing on this, but if you're going to do one of the lower entry uh, opportunities that Rachel's going to talk about, you don't want to spend that much or half that much going to do your due diligence and visit something in person. So you have to balance the risk of, of not visiting the place versus spending $3,000 for a trip to Panama if you're only going to invest you know, less than $10,000. So that's something you don't want the, the due diligence to kill the deal because you you know you spent too much money um, doing your, your doing your research. All right. Um, so I guess at this point, Rachel, I think you're going to give us a brief overview, and then Leaf, I think you have some questions that you want to uh, to ask and bring forward as well. So uh, I, I believe I do. All right. Yeah, fantastic. And you know, I don't want to spend too much time going through the, the nitty gritty details because I know a lot of you online, I recognize your name. I know that you've gone through the business plans before, or at least I've requested additional information. So this is going to be a really high level, quick overview 
of the opportunity. And if you have more specific questions, feel free to reach out to us. But we really put this together because we had seen so many inquiries coming in, so many people who are asking a lot of the same sort of questions. So we wanted to address those questions, but of course, I do want to make sure that you're up to date on the latest as well. So at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is understanding your goals, understanding what you want to accomplish from the sort of investments that you're making. What you'll see there on the screen are a handful of different reasons why folks have decided to invest in the timber farms, specifically the teak farms with us, because they want to accomplish having options or diversification in asset classes and also maybe in different countries as well, having a plan B and options. And if you're looking for a second residency in another country, this is a really great way to get that through this Teak ownership. So again, just really understanding your goals, what you want to accomplish and seeing how Teak could fit into that portfolio. But the quick overview of the agenda of what the next 20 minutes is going to look like is understanding why timber ownership makes sense, looking at opportunities for ownership, and then going through some questions and answers with Leaf. So right over here, we are gonna go through the first reason why people are owning teak. And the first one is very simple. It's just the simplicity of giving back to mother nature. What we're seeing more and more is that mother nature is in desperate need of help. Each minute, 85 acres are being destroyed. And when you become an owner in the teak farm with us, you do commit to reforestation. So I did have a couple of people ask me if you could build a house on the farm. You cannot do that. And this is a certified reforested farm. There are also nice, nice tax benefits to that, which we could talk about offline, but do know that you are committing to mother nature. In addition to that, there's a global demand for teak and the supply is down. And regardless of what sort of investment you're looking at, it's always important to understand what that demand looks like. You don't wanna be investing in something where there is no demand. As the population increases, we do see that the demand for hardwood increases with that, for fine hardwood, in this case, it would be teak. And what we also want to understand is who the buyers of teak are. Where is this demand coming from? So here's a quick graph showing the countries that are projected to be the most populous by 2100. And it's probably no surprise to you that India and China are at the top of this graph. Well, the great news is that the Indians and the Chinese are also the two largest consumers of teak. The Indians and the Chinese are the two largest consumers of teak, which is great when you're looking at who your buyers are of teak. And of course, the supply is down and we're going to talk about that in a moment. What we've seen though is we wanna know that there's value associated with our investment. And we've seen that teak prices have increased on an average of 5.5% per year, and that's specifically plantation teak. And I think uh, at the end we'll have, or Leif, do you wanna talk now about why plantation teak uh, and why it's important to have a teak, that, teak plantation that's well managed and how there's more value associated with that? I know you had a personal experience with this. Right, I, I own two teak properties that aren't associated with you guys. One we bought years ago, um, in Panama for real estate investment. And it's a friend of ours who has 3000 hectares and uh, it's professionally managed like your guys is. It, he did the research, went to the right part of the country, again, where you guys are in the Darien, where you get the right weather, the right amount of rain, the right amount of dry season. The other piece I bought is on a river um, in Baraguas, uh, north of uh, Santiago in Panama. And we didn't buy it for the teak but teak was planted and so we we had our friend on the plantation come out and take a look at it and there were some thinnings that were in the corner of the property and he took a look and counted the rings and said okay these trees are uh, 10 years old leaf but which is the time frame that the people told us they planted the teak but they're about the size of my five-year-old trees in the darien and that was due to lack of management lack of the proper soil uh, but the issue in Panama, you can buy, you can find teak all over in Panama. It's everywhere. It's like a weed practically at this point. <laughs> when the reforestation law came out, which was 93, Mike, 94, um, somewhere around there. Mid 90s, yep. And um, it gave, if you planted timber, so if you got, did reforestation, then you're paid no property taxes and the profits, the gains from the harvest would be tax-free as well, which is true for your plantations. It's true for yeah. mine that I have in the Darien. And so every Panamanian who owned land that they weren't using for something else went out and planted trees. So, and over time, more and more people planted trees. So that's what happened with this piece on the river. But the trees are, they're not totally useless, but they have no commercial value. So in fact, and Mike, you know this, I've, I've harvested a bunch of them already and we're using them at Los Lotes. We, that's what we built the clubhouse you know, the beach club out down there. And we were supposed to have harvested some more um, in March, but of course COVID shut everything down. Right. 
um, to use for the stables. So it's not completely useless, but it has no commercial value. So fortunately I can use it internally. Um, but with the managed plantation, obviously you have better management, timing for thinnings, et cetera. Plus you have someone who has access to a market to sell it because yes. all these people growing teak in Panama on their farms in the middle of nowhere have no way to no way to sell it and not enough volume to sell anyway. Right. Now right. the management of the plantation is absolutely key. Yep. It, it is. And that makes sense as to why properly managed plantation teak would have more value than naturally growing teak because it is grown with the intention to sell. So this slide I think makes a lot of sense. Leaf, you heard the experience from Leaf as well and just really having the right management company, the right soil, the right climate really makes a difference when it comes to the teak. But what we're seeing is that the supply is also down because there have been teak exportation bans in the countries where teak is growing naturally because there's been severe over logging. So as a result, plantation teak has more value and we've seen that there's been more opportunity for that because the naturally growing teak is also not being allowed to be, re uh, to be harvested. All right, third point here is that teak has continued, and timber more generally has continued to produce above average returns and it's ultra safe due to the real value. And here's a chart showing how timber has outperformed the stock market. Um, and I don't necessarily need to read this for you here, but essentially what it's saying is that timber has continued to outperform the stock market without the stock market's frightening volatility. And I think right now during these times that are extremely uncertain, and for those of you who have stocks and have been following the stock market, it's not necessarily a great time for you. But the neat part is that if you own teak, if you own timber, is that the value of teak continues to grow because the trees are literally continuing to grow with it. Here's a quick chart that shows how from 1971, an investment of $10,000 grew to $1.5 million over a about 40 year period. And this is, this is sometimes difficult for people to understand and really conceptualize as the length that it takes for teak to harvest because teak is a hard, hard wood. So it takes about 25 years for it to, to get to the point where it makes sense to harvest it. But the neat part is we have different age teak farms. So we have newborn 14, 20 year old, so if you're not necessarily wanting to wait that full 25 years, there are opportunities for you. Dr. Steve Sugarroot, he's an economist and he's very bullish on ownership of trees. They trees grow through recessions, they grow through wars, they grow through stock and real estate crashes, they grow through everything. They give you built-in investment growth that isn't guaranteed with a stock. And we did see that from 2008 to 2020, where the trees were continuing to grow. And of course the trees are continuing to grow now. For a long time, timber ownership has truly been reserved for the top 1%, maybe the top 1% of the top 1% because they have the resources, the financial resources to pick up a lot of land and to keep this land in the family for generations. Now, some interesting um, investors in timber are the endowment fund because they understand the importance of diversification, you know, not having all their eggs in one basket. And so you'll see that a lot of them do have double digit percentage of their portfolio invested in timber of some sort. Now, there are other, a lot of other Forbes 400 owners who own timber as well. And when you see out there on the screen the amount that they've invested in the timber farms, 240 million, 450 million, these are not necessarily some that a lot of us have sitting in our bank. So it was very difficult for the average investor to get involved in the timber market because if you don't have these sort of resources lying around, it's very, very difficult to get involved in the first place. So what we did is we opened up our farms to smaller parcel sizes so that the average investor could get involved and could benefit from the ownership of teak. Now, when I say average investor, I don't necessarily mean people who don't know what's going on in the stock market or the markets. I just mean people who have, don't necessarily have $450 million laying around to start their own farm. So we have opened up the new opportunities. Leaf mentioned it a little bit earlier, starting under $7,000 uh, for the newborn farms and then going up to about 24,000 for the more mature 20 year old farms. We're gonna talk about those opportunities in a second. But again, going back to value and the worth, teak has been around for centuries, it's nothing new. And one of the big reasons why it's been around for centuries is because it's very, very durable. It's an oily, hard wood. It has a lot of durability to it. Now it's also using a lot of boats. It's using a lot of yachts. If you're a boater, you've probably seen it before, fine furniture. And one of the big reasons it is so attractive is because it's resistant to fire, rot, termites, bugs, insects. And when you're thinking about an investment in timber or agriculture, it's always important to think about the risks. But because teak is resistant to that after age three, it's resistant to fire, rot, termites, bugs, everything we've just talked about, it's more of a secure investment for you. Again, you can go to wayfair.com, check out what the teak prices are, but 
tea products are not cheap. In fact, look at the prices here. For one Adirondack chair, it costs about $800. A teak shower mat, bit of a luxury product here, but people are purchasing it, $250. A rustic teak decorative horse, put it in the corner of your house if you're looking for uh, something to fill there, about $2,900. And these are just built, this is just built on thinnings here, you can see, but real value, real products used today and also was used uh, years and centuries ago. These are pictures from a fellow from one of the Live and Invest Overseas conferences. He came up to me after the, the, the presentation and he said, I build custom gates in the Northeast and here are some examples of teak gates I've, I've built and they usually start at about $65,000 up. So you can see real value and real products being used today. So that's just a really quick overview. We do have all of that sort of information in a teak resource guide. Of course, you can talk to us a little bit more for more information, but wanted to give you the top three reasons why people are owning timber today. There are three opportunities for you to consider. Mature teak, five years until harvest, teenage teak, which is 11 years until harvest, and then newborn teak, which is great for that generational wealth stewardship and building, which is a newborn zero years old at this point, starting at about $7,000. We're gonna go back to this in a second, but I quickly wanted to talk about how you benefit. So number one, you own the land and the trees. You get title to the land, you own the trees. Two, is there a ladder in years of profit? So if you're looking at different ways to invest and looking perhaps at a couple different farms, because there are thinnings that happen at age 12, 18, and 20, there is that big harvest at age 25. If you decide to own a couple of different parcels and you'll have those ladder years of profit. In addition to that, there is the professional management team. We've talked about how important that is. We do have that there, turnkey, peace of mind. You don't have to worry about any of it. And then what happens? You leave a timeless legacy. So you plant, you thin, you harvest, and then you replant and you do it for generations. And this is really what the top 1% has accomplished and has done very, very well. They understand the importance of ownership of, of timber and keeping it in the family, keeping it going. And Mike, I know that this was a big reason why you decided to start the timber farm over 20 years ago. Do you want to explain to us what you were thinking and, and what you think today about your investment? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, uh, uh, in fact, right here, I'm in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Um, you know, the, I, I, uh, I was living here at the time and, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of an interesting story because, you know, Kathy wrote an article and I think it was 97, 98 uh, about teak reforestation. And so uh, we took a look at it. We, we started looking for farms. I did a lot of research. Uh, I traveled down to uh, Panama very, very frequently uh, looking, you know, finding farms, interviewing uh, property, you know, uh, forestry management companies and, and, and really tried to get a good handle on what the business was. And, and, and right across the street from me is the Bavarian Inn. And that's where the Rotary Club meets every Tuesday morning. It still does, you know, 20 years later. Um, you know, and, and so I would go to my Rotary meetings and people would say, Cobb, you know, because if you miss a Rotary meeting, you have to pay a fine or make it up, right? Cobb, where were you last week? Or, hey, you, you know, you're not going to be here next week, whatever. You know, what are you doing? And I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Panama. We're, we're, uh, we're buying a farm. We're going to plant teak trees and we're going to, you know, we're going to harvest them in 25 years and we're going to make a lot of money. And then, you know, and then we're going to replant it and it's going to be the next harvest for the kids. And then they're going to, you know, harvest it and then they're going to replant it for the grandkids and for the great grandkids, right? This, this generational wealth stewardship idea. And, and I can remember the, the people at the Rotary meeting just kind of teasing me and giving me a hard time. And you got to be kidding me, 25 years, like Panama, are you out of your gourd? What are you thinking, Cobb? And, you know, the answer that I came up with is, is the answer that, that really hit home. And, and, and that was this, that, you know, my answer then was, you know what, guys, in 25 years, I'm going to either A, need the money and be really glad I did this, or B, I'm not going to need the money. And I'm going to be really glad I did this. Um, and, you know, and, and now 20 years have gone by and our trees are 20 years old. And I don't know, Rachel's got some pictures of me hugging the trees down there recently. I mean, you know, you can get your arms around them, but barely. I mean, these trees have grown, 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 grown. And, and, and in five more years, whatever, six, five, six more years, we're going to cut them down. And, and, you know, and then we're going to replant them. And I've got two daughters, a 15 year old and a 19 year old. And, you know, we're going to plant the trees and, and maybe the next harvest is for their retirement, you know, and then they're going to replant the trees again. And, and, and those trees would be for the, for the great, my great grandkids, their children. Right. And so, uh, you know, the, the, this generational timeless wealth stewardship uh, is really, really powerful. 
Um, and, 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 and it just takes a small change of mind, right? A small change of mind to say, you know what? In 25 years, or by the way, you can buy 20 year old teak. Rachel, you, you, we've got parcels that are 20 years old. So it's five, six years to harvest. Uh, we have 14 year old teak. So if your timelines are shorter and you, or you can't imagine, you know, the, the, the time, right? You can, you can own parcels that are much closer to harvest and then the replant for the, but, 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 the, but the change of mindset is just simply in 25 years, I'm either going to need the money and I'm going to be really glad I did this or I'm not going to need the money and I'm going to be really glad I did this. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that, that was the basic philosophy. And I think the philosophy still holds true. In fact, I'm still planting teak. Rachel, at our Grand Pacifica property, uh, we continue to plant teak every year, about 10 hectares, which is about 25 acres. So every year we're planting between 20 and 25 acres of teak every year. And I'm 55. And you know what? When I'm 85, I hope we're still planting 25 acres of teak every year. Um, not that I'll expect to see that harvest at 110, but, uh, but maybe my great grandkids <laughs> will. So, yeah. Hey, there's, there's great health care these days, Mike. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, you're exactly right. And, and thinking about it from that legacy perspective is really important and changing that mindset because especially if you're a real estate investor where you're used to the monthly check or you have a vacation rental and you're used to the nightly, the, the nightly money coming in, it's a very different perspective, but it's one that you do really need to consider as you build out that portfolio. So thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, and then one more bonus, if you are looking to protect your most important asset, there are residency options available as well in both Panama and Nicaragua. So do contact us if you want more information there. And you do see that we accept Bitcoin. So if you have cryptocurrency, and not just Bitcoin, but other cryptocurrencies as well, if you're looking to unload, uh, feel free to let us know and we can certainly help you out with that. Not gonna go into extreme detail here, but. Uh, do reach out to us if you want more information. So the second, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And that is extremely true. And we have two resource guides for you. The first one is Precious Teak, What You Need to Know. This is a teak resource guide. It's a white paper that has more updated charts than what I showed you. It has everything that you need to know about the teak market, the history, the current market of it, and what we expect to happen in the future. And then we also have a Panama handbook. So if you want these details, feel free to let us know. Um, you can email, it says expat down there, but you can email info at tcardwoods.com or make it even easier and just click reply to the email that we sent to you about this and we'll get these over to you. These two free e-resources, really great content in there and goes much deeper into the market than we talked about during this presentation. So to quickly recap, and then we're going to jump into the FAQs and the Q&A section. Uh, we have three different opportunities for you to consider depending on what your timeline looks like and depending on what your investment goals are. There's mature 20 year old teak. So if you were listening before, you know that the teak harvest cycle is 25 years. So do that quick math there. We're looking at about five, six years until harvest of this farm. In addition to that, there's teenage teak. So 14 years old, uh, do that math there. That's 11 years until we are ready for harvest. And then newborn teak. This is brand new, brand spanking new, zero years old. So you do that math there. It's 25 years until the harvest cycle. You don't have to wait all 25 years until you start to see co something come back. There is what we call thinnings, which happen at age 12, 18, and 20, and you receive those profits as well. But as a thank you for joining us, as a thank you for continuing to do your due diligence, we are offering you $400 off each parcel doesn't matter if it's a newborn, doesn't matter if it's a mature parcel, you do get $400 off each. And what a lot of savvy investors are doing is picking up, you know, if they're able to afford it one of each or maybe two, just depending on, again, what they're looking to accomplish, but it helps them to accomplish that laddered profit schedule. So again, something for you to consider there if you are looking for different means of getting income at different years. $400 off each parcel, there's the email address, use that info at tcardwoods.com. We'll send you additional information. We'll give you that business plan. We'll give you residency information if that's something that's on your mind, but feel free to reach out. In addition to that, uh, if you want those teak, the Teak Resource Guide, just write Precious in the email, or if you want the Panama Handbook, you can write Handbook, and there's the email address right down here, info at tcardwoods.com. So what I'm gonna do at this point, because I promised Leaf that this would be about 30 minutes, is that we're gonna go through some questions that Leaf has received. Uh, from many different folks. And what we did is combine about five or six different questions that we've gotten from, from people all over the board who wanted to learn a little bit more about the opportunity. So Leaf, what we'll do is hand over to you to ask the questions and then Mike and I will get those answered for everyone.
I only have to ask them. I don't you have to answer them as well. If you want to answer them, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> um, well, and I'll and I'll point out, looking at the middle the middle ground. And I know we talked about this late last year and, and was mentioning it to people. But the other side of the and this may help answer um, the first question. In fact, why should someone consider Teak ownership? But you know, Mike's talking about legacy and long term planning. Uh, if you if you are looking to gift something to a child or a grandchild or a great grandchild now. Um, you can, you know, buy them a 14-year-old teak parcel for 15280 I think the gift tax exemption is 15000 at this point. Um, and give that to, you know, someone under 10 years old, and they can use this for uh, paying for their college when it, uh, when it uh, matures. Or yes. other, you know, there's other ways you can think of, think it through. Um, but so that gets back to the question, so why should someone consider teak ownership and... So what's your answer, Rachel? It, absolutely. And obviously the legacy one is a big part of that. And I think also for those of you who really do care about the environment, knowing that you are committing to reforestation uh, is a critical component in this. And you are committing to replanting the trees after harvest. You can't live on the land. You can't build your house out there. We are committing to that reforestation process. And uh, again, like I said, I know a lot of us really are concerned about that and considerate about it. So I think that's one of the big benefits there as well. Uh, and you talked about the generational wealth stewardship. Also, if you are looking for that plan B option, uh, and I know right now, especially in the situation that we're in, you know, a lot of us kind of feel like we're locked in somewhere, like we're stuck. But as soon as this is all lifted, if you're able to get another residency or obtain another residency, a lot of us, I think, are going to be doing that because it re we realize that we'll have options. There'll be more available to us in terms of our freedom. And so you are able to apply for residency through ownership of Teak. Again, we can go through those details, but I think that's a really nice benefit to it. And as we saw in the previous slides, there's just a real demand for it. There's real worth. And when you're looking at ownership of an investment or you're looking at an investment generally, you do want to know that there is value behind the product. You want to know that there's a demand and we do continue to see that. And we do have, again, all of that in the precious Teak resource guide. Just message us, put precious, P-R-E-C-I-O-U-S, if you want to get a copy of that, um, because it really highlights the market well. And, and let me jump in and also just add that, you know, it, it, the idea of diversification and hard assets, right? I mean, so it's diversification outside of traditional stocks, bonds, even precious metals, which are another hard asset or, or real estate, as you mentioned, Rachel, owning a, you know, owning a, a, a rental property or something like that. This, this, is, this is another type of diversification. And then there's also the element of diversifying outside your home country. Uh, and, and if you don't have an asset in, a, in another country, um, you know, th that is also a very, very important part of diversification. But ultimately, if you look at, let's say, the middle one, I think, Leif, uh, your example is a great one of the generational wealth stewardship. An investment of $15,000 turns into $90,000 over 11 years. That is a phenomenal investment. That, 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 that's that's an uh, internal rate of return of, of uh, uh, double digits, 11, 12%, something like that. And so Teak is a great investment. There are a lot of reasons why you, know, you might want to own it, right, that are outside of that. But it's also in and of itself intrinsically an incredible investment uh, as well. Great. All right. Next one here. So, oh, well, so, right. So who, who are you seeing by this? What's the demographic of the buyer? Mm -hmm. um, who's interested in this kind of thing. Cause I know like, again, years ago when I bought in Panama, it was purely for the, for the residency side of things, although there was the investment side. Um, but uh, now we're seeing more people looking for the investment side, I think, and looking yes. for someplace. It's a safe place to add to what Mike was saying. It's a safe place to park some money and let it be stored in the trees and the trees grow. I just wrote an article yesterday about the, the gold guy that um, we know he's really happy because the world's going to come to an end and he's been predicting it with gold for 40 years. Um, and, you know, gold can make sense for storing wealth, but I think for putting money in trees that are going to continue to grow um, is a good place to, to store wealth. But So what are the types of buyers you're seeing, Rachel? It's a, it's a great question. And one of the responses I get probably from people who are 60 plus go, oh, I wish I knew about this opportunity when I was younger. But that's why we have 20 year old teak for, for those folks. But uh, really, in reality, we're seeing buyers from all across the board. Our youngest investor at the time that he invested was 21 years old. 
he didn't have he doesn't have a family he's not married but he was really thinking about this from that aspect of him or his family at some point in the future seeing two three four harvests and that really appealed to him and he had an older brother who was helpful in him seeing the benefits of it but he was 21 years old at the time he's 24 25 at this point but then our oldest investor was 92, 93 when he invested. And his mindset was a little bit different. He'd done well in life. And what he really wanted to do was leave something for his grandkids and great grandkids. So he, he purchased a ton of parcels, uh, was able to gift one to each of the grandkids. And then from there left something for them uh, as they get older in life and they'll have the thinnings come in, they'll have the profits from the harvest come in. So like you talked about before Leaf, where you, you, the, the money's coming at the right time for a lot of these, these kids and grandkids where They'll need it for the wedding or the house that they're purchasing or it'll be a brand new car that they're getting or college or grad school. And so there are a lot of benefits to it. So there's not necessarily one specific sort of buyer. Uh, we are seeing that it ranges from you know, the 21 year olds up to the 93, 94 year olds. But a lot of the time they're thinking about this generational wealth stewardship accomplishing. Uh, that is very important to a lot of people, but also the fact that you're able to get a harvest or two in is also something we do want to see. And there are opportunities for that. Yeah, and for me, it's a way, it's a way of, of, of lock, just locking up money because it's not like it's not a stock that you can go sell and right. you know, and, and buy a new car with tomorrow. You've got to wait for the trees to grow, wait, wait for them to be sold. So it, it kind of forces you to be frugal with that particular asset, which is nice. And you're giving it to you know a teenager for their college years or for you know for them to buy a house. They can't waste it um, until it's harvested. So at least it gives them some them some time to mature as well um, when they receive the funds, by the time they receive the funds. Right. And, exactly. and Leaf, even if, even if that generation wastes it, it gets replanted and then their kids would have the opportunity to do something you know, prudent with it. So right. Right, even, if, even if a harvest is wasted, there's the next one. So right. yeah. yep, great point. Um, so how's the ownership process work here? I know you guys are segregating individual yes. pieces um but you, you get a title in the end right it's it's, it's yes. direct it's direct ownership it is direct ownership you do get title to it most folks are deciding to own it in their personal name or a panama company uh, you are able to use your self-directed ira if it has an llc that is owned entirely by the self-directed ira there are some additional costs to that for registering that foreign company in panama but it is doable so we're seeing all across the board but most folks are doing it through their personal name or through um, a Panama company. But and I've been getting this question more about Panama in particular, because we do sell a lot in Panama, mm -hmm. about um, probate and how that works and can you use a US will. And in fact, so over the, over the last year, we've looked more into this and uh, been told by several attorneys at this point, so I believe it. If I ask one attorney in Panama, I don't quite believe until I get the same answer from another. But uh, a U.S. will can be registered in Panama for the probate process, so you don't necessarily have to have a Panama will, although generally that's, it's better if you, to have a will in the country if you have assets. Um, and, but you do have to go through the probate process. So the LLC, even if it's not in an, an IRA, would allow you to avoid the probate process in Panama, but it does come with extra costs with that registration. Um, right. Panama charges. And, and I think a, a, a will in Panama is just a couple hundred bucks, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not very well, it, it, it should be. Depends on the attorney you ask. <laughs> you know, I, I ended up getting a will down there a few years ago, and it wasn't, it really wasn't much. Just to know that you have your estate in a row, it really, it really doesn't cost much to have that sort of peace of mind. So I, I would recommend that. It's super easy. When you go down to Panama, you can get that all set up. But but yes, I think it is It is worth doing, but of course it's nice though. I didn't realize that LEAF is that you can register your, your US will yeah. or wherever you are. So good. Well, good yeah, what, and even, even after you're dead, your, your heirs can register it is what we're being told. So oh, great. It, it's, it's not like that in every country, but uh, right. it seems like Panama does uh, make it a bit uh, easier in that case, which kind of leads into the next question we have here, which is um, how to structure the investment. How can I structure it? And you kind of answered that. You can own it in your own name. You can own it in a, in a foreign LLC. You can own it in a Panama corporation. My one caveat about a Panama corporation is that that at some point can cause um, some US tax hiccups um, from a passive income uh, perspective. For Americans, for Canadians, it's better to own it in a, in a corporation because LLCs cause them a tax hiccup. So, um, but, and there's also a Panama Foundation, which is another option for somebody if they want to uh, have a more uh, more structured ownership uh, and long-term and maybe want to put other assets into that foundation as well. 
And you know, one point I do want to make is that titling in Panama takes a really long time. And I know if you're from North America, you're usually used to titling happening in 30 to 60 days. In, in Panama, it could be a few years. And I do want to say that because there are people, you know, we, we share that with them and then they come back two months, three months later, four months later, and like, where's my title? And do know that it takes time. But the promissory note, which is the agreement that we complete between you, between us, is the agreement that acts as your deed until you get that physical deed from the lands department. So just understand that getting that physical deed is going to take a little bit of time, but you do have that promissory note, which acts as the deed in the meantime. So just, just do remember that. And that's true for generally across Central America here. It does take some time to get titles processed. Yeah, well, not, not to scare everybody off of Panama altogether if they're buying like a, a house that already exists and has already been transacted before. Um, you should be able to get a title within a month or so. It's the, the, yeah. the, the segregation process that you guys are going through and the fact that you're issuing new titles, that's right. what throws a spanner in the works from the bureaucracy in Panama and the same out at Los Lotes. Um, we have, you know, it's, it takes longer because it's the first, first title for that particular property. Right. So that's, that's the bureaucracy there. And you just have to be patient. And as you said, your, your proof of ownership is the contract that you have. So right. you're, you're secure uh, from, from a legal perspective that way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right, and then you talked about this really with regard to uh, residency, but are there any other uh, benefits to TEAK ownership? Yeah, I would say residency really is the big one there. And it is something that I would recommend everybody consider, even if you're not necessarily thinking about Panama as a place to relocate to. Panama is one of the easiest countries in the world to get residency. You only have to visit one day every two years. And once you have your card, it is a permanent card. So you don't need to worry about continuing to reapply and and getting it for another term. So I would recommend it, but again, that's up to you and, and what you're looking to accomplish, but we can talk about that with you. I got my residency in Panama about four or five years ago through this program specifically, live in Belize. Don't necessarily have an interest in living in Panama, but who knows, maybe at some point. So again, just something to consider. And that is a really big benefit for a lot of people. But um, I did see one question come through that does kind of relate to what we talked about is titling it in the name of the kids. You are able to title the parcel in the name of your kids or grandkids. If they're under 18, then their legal guardian would be the one who signs off on the power of attorney. But if they're 18 or older, then they'd be the one who's completing a power of attorney for the attorney to complete the titling process. So uh, do bear that in mind is that you can title it in the name of the kid or grandkid if you choose to do that. At least talked about the gifting option, which I think is, is a great way to go about it. Maybe if there's a birthday coming up or a holiday, and maybe you just want to give them a, a gift of tea, that'd be great. But uh, I think that that's Pretty, pretty important to understand that you are able to do that. I think we're right up here on the hour. Yeah, well, we went over, sorry, Leif, we went over that 30 minutes that we mentioned. No worries. But um, you feel free to hop off if you want. I do see a couple more questions coming through uh, that I'll get answered for folks and then we can go from there. Mike, Mike Lee, feel free to stay on or you can, uh, you, you can hop off if you choose to. All right, I, I'll, I'll head out. Thanks guys, good to see you. Bye, Thanks, thank Leif. you, Leif. Talk stay to safe. you soon. Bye. Bye. Alrighty, so I'm seeing here, are you able to forward the slides? Yes, we are able to send you the slides and I see that you're looking for the residency passport information. John, what we'll do is also send you a PDF that has more information about what that process looks like. Uh, Wendy asked how is it documented that we own the property? So you complete the promissory note and the promissory note is the legal binding contract between us and you until you get that physical deed. When you get the physical deed, then you can file that away. Uh, but that is how it is documented through the lands department there in Panama. Uh, all right, the next question, David, is the residency included in the investment of the zero year tree? So if you're looking at the residency aspect, it is an additional $4,680 for the primary applicant. And then you can add, add dependents for $1,900 each. But with residency in Panama, this is specifically through the Friendly Nations visa, do note that it is a minimum of $10,000 invested in land. So what you would want to do is pick up two of the newborn parcels or perhaps one of the teenage or one of the 20 year old, but it does need to be over that 20 year old threshold. All right, he said, I'm a young man, just got to 20 and it would take me about three months to get to 7,000. Would I still be able to invest after three months? Absolutely, we can talk about payment schedules and payment plans that best fit what uh, works for you. So absolutely. Next question is, how expensive would it be to register this in a Nevis LLC? 
great question. So to register a foreign company in Panama, the cost is $2,250. So $2,250 plus taxes. That is money that goes to the attorney. The attorney coordinates that registration with the Panama government. But the great part is that once you have that company registered, let's say you decide you want to own something else in Panama through that company, you don't need to re-register it. It's already registered. So think of it as a one-time fee that allows you or allows that business to do business in Panama. Jerome, great question. What is the cost to replant? At today, the cost to replant per parcel is $300 US. Can't guarantee that's what it's going to be at the time of replanting, but that is what it is at today. Jeff, yes, we will send you the slides. Uh, we do have the recordings. We can get you more information, Kyle. I'm seeing a lot more questions come through here. So what we will do is uh, reach out to you, go through your questions personally. It seems like there are a lot of personal questions coming in. And then from there, we can go through questions, go through anything that's on your mind, and of course, give you the details. We will be sending out this slide deck if you want it. I don't think it's going to be in the email that you're going to receive after this. In the email you'll receive after this, it will have the recording. But if you do want to get this slide deck, just send me a note and we will get that over to you. Info at tcardwoods.com. What you see there at the bottom part of the screen is the best email address to get to us at, and we will go from there. Thank you everybody for joining us today, uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever in the world you may be. And we look forward to welcoming you to the Teak family if it makes sense to you. Thank you. And again, thank you, Mike. And I know Leaf, uh, Leaf jumped off before, but thank you to the both of you for joining us. As well. Absolutely. And, and the only thing I would add is uh, if this is something that is exciting to you, and, and obviously you, you've spent the time to join us with the webinar, uh, I would encourage you to move forward. Uh, it, it really is something that uh, I am so glad I did. You know, 20 years later, uh, I'm really glad I did this. And, and, and I think you will be too. So uh, again, if this is something that you're looking at, please uh, move ahead. You will be very, very glad you did this. Absolutely. Thank you. All righty, everybody. Thank sure, you. Bye. We look forward to connecting.